So we have the Building Safety Act, but there are other things to talk about. And I'm going to leap in with my two kind of pet subjects at the moment, and they're kind of linked. Um, procurement. So clients set the conditions for success or failure at the start of the project by determining the way they procure. We have an industry that's been optimized as a result of 40 or 50 years of clients trying to drive capital costs down without regard to other um, value or quality-led indicators. Um, and that's created a, a very difficult environment for people to um, do the right thing, to go beyond the minimum. And until that changes, it's going to be much, much harder, not impossible by any stretch of the means, it's been much harder for engineers and um, others working in the industry to change um, the outcomes. So procurement's kind of big issue still, and I think clients haven't recognised the need for change to the extent they should. The HSE and DLUC have published a guidance, a guidance document on collaborative procurement, and there is an expectation that people are going to procure differently and for, uh, to achieve different aims with different values over time. So that's one. Connected with that, construction products. So we have the Morel Day report recently published, which suggests that in order to have a construction products regime that people can trust and that delivers uh, faithful, reliable information on likely performance, um, there are a whole series of further steps that need to be taken beyond those that were proposed in the Building Safety Act. It's very, very difficult for engineers and others to um, uh, interrogate in, in detail every aspect of the information that they're provided with, but that information is fundamental to the decisions they make. So until we get a bit further down the road in terms of reforming the reliability uh, and the robustness of the construction product testing regimes, um, that's going to remain a challenge and, and engineers are going to have to remain uh, particularly diligent um, in um, testing the assumptions that uh, underpin those decisions. Yeah, and I think engineers of all varieties are going to have to be prepared to ask some tough questions about products. Yeah. You know, I want a product for this purpose. Can you, potential supplier, demonstrate to me that what you're offering is fit for purpose and if I use it, it will be safe? And I think product manufacturers and suppliers are in for a shock because... Engineers should be saying, if you can't convince me of that, I don't want your product on my tender list. Uh, and the days of, well, you know, we'll give you the information we want and we won't give you the information we don't want, I think are, are going to get challenged. Uh, so the construction products piece, I think, could get quite lively alongside all the other building safety things. And if I can add a third thing, Richard, to, to procurement and construction products, I think the other big challenge is just the scale of change in the industry. And it's not just the Building Safety Act. Um, we've got all the, uh, all the work that's going on around net zero carbon. Uh, and again, looking at net zero carbon over the whole life of a building, not just during construction. Um, and a greater emphasis on embodied carbon. Um, so we've got, we've got that challenge, we've got the building safety challenge, and then there's everything going on around digitalization in construction. Um, all around the construction products piece, how much of that could be digitalized? Um, the regulator is looking to create the golden thread or to create the framework for the golden thread, and that is supposed to be digital. Well, how's that going to work? And is it just going to be the 12,500 higher risk buildings? Or are we going to find that blue chip clients say, actually, I want a digital record for my asset. Um, so I think we've got three big challenges. Um, we've got all the Building Safety Act uh, changes, we've got net zero, and we've got digitalization. And I'm not sure we've seen pace uh, change at that pace uh, in any of our working lives. I mean, when you look at all of these factors kind of lining up, what I see 
is a tipping point for the industry. So we've had an industry that's focused on statutory compliance and very transactional relationships. So have I met my contractual obligation? Great, I can move on. Um, climate change, safety, these issues are only achieved where you've got suitable quality control to deliver the performance and outcomes that you need. Yeah. And that is a, a massive change for industry because it totally changes the way that you focus on your deliverables. And we're not there yet, but at some point in the next four or five years, industry business models are going to have to flip between this transactional approach, which is kind of highly risky and um, is a real, really problematic element of um, the, the, the problems we see. It's going to have to flip to looking at uh, quality control, quality management, um, higher levels of surety. Uh, and those are good things because those things that will drive productivity, it will drive efficiency, it will drive performance, and it will also, of course, deliver more sustainable buildings and safe buildings. But it's that it's the scale of change in terms of the business models and all of the transactional relationships that are within the industry that's needed to actually jump that gap, if you like. What it's going to do to the way projects are run, I think, is going to be a challenge. So everybody's got very used to the RIBA plan of work. That there are other uh, ways of, of managing projects. And everybody's very used to, at this stage, we do this. And I think that's going to be quite significantly challenged because some of the questions that are being asked are going to require things to be done earlier in the process. Um, and again, I think that's going to have a knock on for procurement um, because suddenly people are going to look at it and say, hang on a minute, what we've been doing for the last 10, 20 years may not actually work in, in this new regime, especially where uh, it's a higher risk building and you've got to have a completed design at Gateway 2 before you start to build. That's really going to throw, throw things up in the air. I think it goes further even. Um, at Gateway 3, you have to have a safety case that um, substantiates how the design and construction of the building marries with an operational regime. Yep. Realistically, you need to establish that um, operational model um, before planning Gateway 1, before you start to lock down the fundamentals of the building. And that's, again, it's another gap that's existed. We've all known it's been there, that the operational models haven't been integrated into client briefs early enough, um, and that leads to all sorts of problems. But um, if you want to go through that process in a way that you arrive at Gateway 3 confident you're going to get your registration and um, your uh, occupation certification, then I think you have to have the safety case report in at that much earlier stage. Yeah, uh, and actually I think... I think at Planning Gateway 1, you're going to have to have an idea how you're going to manage the building. Yeah. Because the regulator, I think, is going to be looking at what people say at Planning Gateway 1 and asking, are they making realistic assumptions about the way this building is going to be operated? Um, have they actually got a draft management strategy? Because if they're making assumptions and they haven't got a draft, we can't be confident that what they're putting forward at Planning Gateway 1 will work. And certainly at Planning Gateway 2, if the design decisions are predicated on managing the building in a particular way, they're going to want to, well, what, are your, what is your plan for managing the building? Because what you're proposing might work under one management regime, but it certainly won't work under another. Um, so I, I, think, I think we're going to see people having to think about how they manage the buildings earlier. And the traditional model where building management is let on a three-yearly cycle to the cheapest bidder, um, I can't see that surviving. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, and in two ways. Um, it's going to be a statutory requirement for HRBs because they will have to have and maintain the so-called golden thread of information, which I suspect, um, having looked at the section in the Building Safety Act about 
keeping information will probably pop out as the um, building safety brackets, keeping and maintaining information, close brackets, regulations, which just doesn't sound as catchy as the golden thread, does no. it? But that's that's what, what you know, something like that. Um, and for HRBs, they will be required to keep a core set of information about their building up to date, accurate, secure, um, easily transferred to other parties who are entitled to it. So you've got a multi-use building um, that's got some residential in it. It's got a hotel in it. It's got um, it's got some offices in it. It's got some retail. You've got different responsible um, persons. You've got a principal accountable person. There's a whole lot of information flows, and that's all expected to be done electronically. And if it's an HRB, that's all going to be in legal requirements. Um, but it's, frankly, the golden thread isn't just for HRBs. It's where we should be going with pretty much all building, um, but certainly in the commercial sector, it should really be business as usual. Yeah, yeah and clients should pay for that oh, as absolutely. well. Oh, uh, absolutely. The benefits to them over time are enormous. Um, uh, the efficiencies you gain from having the right information uh, the improvements in safety of the gain are yeah. massive. Uh, but also, engineers looking at their liability or exposure over time, if you don't record the information that demonstrates how you did comply, if something goes wrong and you're in front of the man in a white wig trying to explain uh, why that's the case, uh, if you haven't got the right information to hand, you're going to be much more exposed than if you manage all of that information responsibly. And, and as we've said, you know, the timescales over which you may be challenged are much, much different to where the industry has been in the past, um, very much longer indeed. And, and frankly, I think some of the bigger clients, some of the blue chip property investors, are increasingly going to want to see the industry providing them with information digitally uh, and maybe starting to differentiate in, in contract awards between those who are prepared to work digitally and those who aren't. Um, so I, I, you know, I, think, I think there's going to be a, a big push that way. Um, we've, and we've got British standards around digital information exchange and information management which, which push us that way. So you know, I, I, I just I, I struggle with people who say, oh, well, construction's different. Well, yeah, it is different, and I think sometimes not for very good reason. Shall I go first? You go first. And then you can fill in all the things I, f I miss out. Um, well, for the first time, we're going to regulate the 12 and a half 13,000 higher risk buildings, residential buildings in occupation. We've never regulated residential buildings in occupation in this way before. Yes, we've had the Housing Act and we've had um, various standards, but the idea of having a regulator who takes a systemic view of each of those buildings and is presented with a safety case report that needs to be kept up to date and used to manage the risks in that building. We've never done anything like that before. It's a completely new departure. Although I think it's one that, that, that's needed given what emerged in the Grenfell Tower inquiry. Um, so that, that's the first big thing. Second big thing, the focus on competence. And that, unless anybody thinks that because the trigger for the Building Safety Act was the Grenfell Tower fire. Grenfell Tower was a high-rise high building. I meet people who say, oh, but the Building Safety Act's only for high-rise buildings. No, it isn't. It's for any building where you do regulated building work. So if you've got to go to building control, you've got to function under the requirements of the Act. Now, that doesn't mean you've got to get the Act and, and start reading it, because a lot of it's worked out in the building regulations and other ways. But um, it's a massive change for everything we build, and I'm not sure that many in the industry realise that. Um, and one of the big things, it's requiring people to be competent. 
uh, and clients are going to have a duty to make sure that the people they appoint are competent. Now, you know, I think I think regulation of occupied buildings and competence are two huge changes all on their own, um, and that's before we start to think about some of the changes in the Act around products. But I suspect Richard might have one or two to add to that. About the competence requirements in the Building Safety Act and in the regulations that flow from it are that they don't just address qualifications. It's a total misnomer and if anyone thinks that that competence equals qualifications that's not the case. What the Act requires two things. Firstly having systems in place to manage competence. That means assessing people's competence and understanding what they can and can't do. It means having processes in place to maintain and develop their competence over time. It means having the right systems in place to allocate competent people to do tasks as they come up so you get the right people doing the right job. So you've got a very systemic part um, of the requirements and all of that's focused on delivering compliance with relevant requirements of the building regulations. But you've also got a series of duties to communicate and collaborate and to share information. You have a series of, of duties to walk away if you don't believe building work is compliant, whether you're a designer or a contractor. Designers have obligations to raise concerns about the design work of any other person in the design team if they believe it may be non-compliant. They have to report that to the principal designer. So these requirements actually put into law, and these are building regulations. This, these are not nice to have. These are regulatory requirements in the same way that all of the other parts of the regulations are requirements that drive a, a really significant culture change as well as a series of procedural changes. Uh, and I think that that's going to have a massive impact. We, we also have requirements on clients to ensure that there's sufficient time and resource to execute the work so that it's compliant. So for the first time, and I talked about procurement earlier, for the first time, clients can be held accountable if they don't make a reasonable assessment of cost, and we know that's a problem, and if they don't allow sufficient time for the work to be executed properly, and we know that's a problem too. Um, so these are absolutely enormous changes. I think the second issue I would, I would kind of flag as the big change is having a, a, a regulator who's going to be active in the marketplace. So we've worked in a construction industry for decades where enforcement on building regulations matters has been incredibly rare to the point of almost being non-existent. Yes, there's a lot of in, in, in what's referred to as informal enforcement that goes on. Um, and there's a lot of activity focused on compliance, but active enforcement has been um, largely absent. Um, we know that the Building Safety Regulator as part of the HSE sees enforcement not just as something that's, that's normal, but, but, but they see it as absolutely essential as a day-to-day -day part of their work. They have a duty and a series of powers to also make recommendations to sponsor department if they think that the system's inadequate. So if they're not seeing enforcement taking place in the way that they want it to, or the way that they believe is necessary, I think they're going to start to push to change the system. But what we can certainly expect early on is for the building safety regulator to test its powers and enforcement powers. I suspect they will um, look for local authorities to support both financially or to underwrite prosecutions to strengthen case law and set the tone. So for an industry that's got used to uh, very rare enforcement, virtually everything in the industry is enforced through um, contractual claims. To be honest, it's that transactional set of relationships. That's where the arguments have been settled historically. So that people should really start to expect to see a lot more in terms of formal enforcement um, over time. And the building safety regulator is going to work as the HSE does. It's going to be joined up. It's going to be intelligence-led. So that means it'll be looking to identify repeat bad actors, the people, the bad eggs um, that keep cropping up. And it's going to start targeting them with the very extensive regulatory and investigative powers that it has under the Act. And again, these were powers that just didn't exist, and that there was no government agency or interaction of, of that nature at all. So I think that's going to be a huge change for the industry as well. And, and two quick things I'd add to that, Richard. Um, people say, oh, it's a new regulator. How will we know how it's going to behave? Well, yes, the building safety regulator is new, but it's being set up within the HSE, which is 50 years old next year. So if you want to know how the regulator is going to operate, just look at how the HSE has, has enforced. And they had a big conference back on the 22nd of March. 
And if you go to the HSC website, there are two news releases on that day. One of them is all about how they had a thousand people at Westminster Central Hall hearing about the new regime, and it's a good news story. The other news release is about a prosecution of a building owner in Derbyshire who had been found guilty of not undertaking proper work. Uh, he was converting or having barns converted into holiday lets. A wall collapsed on a labourer and I, from what I've read, I doubt that man will work again. And that individual was prosecuted and sentenced to, I think it was 200 hours of community service. If people want to know how will the new regulator operate, the juxtaposition of those two news releases is a story in its own right. And I think it, it, it tells us a lot. And the other thing, and this perhaps is particularly relevant for, for CABE members, um, the old informal mechanism of the building control officer turning up on site and giving advice to people, if they're regulators and if that project is meant to have a principal designer, you can't have the building control officer turning up and giving design advice. So it's going to become much more, I am not satisfied that what you're doing is compliant, you're supposed to be competent, Therefore, you must know what's needed to make it compliant. When you've worked it out and done it, give me a call and I'll come back and have another look. And I suspect there'll be another fee for an inspection visit as well. So the industry's got to get used to not treating the building control officer as an... Well, it's not quite unpaid because they do pay... A, but they're not there as a backup advisor to people who aren't quite sure how to do it. If you're not sure find somebody who is and get them to give you proper advice and pay for it. Yeah, I mean, this is the kind of pattern of the things to come, I think. So the HSC, you can see them starting to identify areas where they think behaviours or traditional approaches are wrong. And they're starting to come out with really clear messaging. So the design advice issue is one. Um, this is an area that we talk about to our members on a regular basis uh, now to kind of flag that expectations may be changing. Um, the other issue that they've identified and um, are, it seems determined to force change through is around the principal designer role. Mm. Uh, now, historically, the regulations under the construction design and management regulations always said that the principal designer should be a designer who um, acts as the principal designer, so someone from within the design team, preferably with a large degree of control over the design of the work. But quite often that's been outsourced. It's been... Um, uh, taken out of the design team and given to a third party consultant. The HSC have started to be really clear now that they expect both for CDM and for Building Act compliance purposes that the principal designer is a designer within the design team. And, and there's a good reason for that, which is that they have the greatest capacity to integrate safety thinking into the design and construction process. So it's fascinating to see that they're picking up some some, some issues that have been around for a while, some new issues that they're coming across, but they're, they're, they're looking at these issues and they're not afraid to try and deal with them. Um, and they're dealing with them pretty much head on, I think. So we can expect that to happen. When they come across issues, they'll build their evidence base. And once they're clear that they understand, they'll, they'll start to act to drive behaviours and changes in the way that the industry operates. Yeah. And the HSC aren't complete newbies to this. They've been looking after construction sites for many years. So um, the HRB regime for in design and construction, let's do design and construction first, and then we'll talk about occupation. That's a good way to do it. So for design and construction, the new high-risk building regime uh, creates a much more rigid and challenging framework um, to uh, clearly drive um, higher levels of compliance, um, but focused on safe outcomes. We've mentioned earlier, we've talked about the gateway regime, but uh, these gateways are hard stop, what they refer to as hard stop gateways. So uh, you can't proceed beyond those points until you've got agreement that what you're doing is right. Um, there is an enormous amount of uh, procedural um, and systemic uh, reformulation of how you need to operate to evidence um, what you're doing at those gateways. Um, 
in particular between gateways two and three, which is the kind of pre-construction stage and the occupation stage, there are a whole series of mandatory um, occurrence reporting requirements, change control procedures um, that are going to be really challenging for the industry. But they're there to address specific problems. So uh, the change control process, for instance, is there to address product substitution or cost-driven modifications to design and specification during the construction phase. It's a problem that's been known about for quite a long time. Uh, but this is a system that is intended to make it really painful to make willful choices in that period. It's very, you know, the intent is very clear. Um, there are a whole series of other procedural documentation that you have to comply with, golden thread, um, uh, building control plans, um, the construction control plans. There's a whole series of measures against which the regulator will hold that construction process uh, to account. Uh, and that's going to be a, a huge change um, at that stage of the work. Um, and then we've got the certification and registration for occupation. Again, hard stop gateways with um, quite long time limits. Uh, and you're not allowed to occupy until you've got through the certification um, process. Uh, so again, uh, a huge change to uh, industry practice in terms of when they start work and when they can occupy the building. Yeah, and I mean, pe people have said to me, well, they can't be serious about some of those things um, because some, of, some changes will require you to stop work, notify the regulator, and not restart until the regulator has said, yes, that change is acceptable. And I think the regulator has potentially 20 days in which to make that decision. So you're saying we have to stop work on site for 20 days. We, we can't do that. Well, if you can't do that, then perhaps you need to make jolly sure that you're not going to need to make that sort of change in the middle of construction. Uh, and perhaps people need to reflect that the reason that some of the change control is as draconian as it is, is to discourage people from making those changes. Do, do your homework at the design stage. Um, make sure that there is a reasonable supply chain for the things that you want to put in that building so that you haven't got to stop part way through uh, and, and source an alternative. Um, does that mean that projects might go to Gateway 2 with a provision to use product A or possibly product B, and it might in part depend on what's available at the time. Well, I think the regulator would far rather be signing off it'll be this or this at that stage than we get part way through, oh, there's a supply chain issue, oh, the containers got stuck in China, um, we need to make a quick change. Yeah, but that change then needs to be evaluated. What, what's the impact of making that change on the, on the overall safety case. Um, you know, it's back to viewing a whole a building as an engineering system and not just a kit of parts. Um, so I, you know, I, I think some of this is actually a preemptive strike to force people to think, do you know what? It's actually going to be cheaper to do what they want than to try and game it. Absolutely, and, and it's not accidental, it's entirely intentional. So yeah. the change control process requires you to state why you're changing something as well. So it may be a perfectly legitimate change, but the regulator has the opportunity to refuse to accept it if you're doing it purely on a cost basis. Well, yeah, I was going to say, if you say, well, actually, we've, um, we've had the cost consultant come in and say that if we use product X from this local supplier, it'll be 25% cheaper, so we're going to go with that. I'm not sure the regulator's going to sign that off. Actually, I'm pretty sure they're not going to sign it off. So, yeah, the, you know, some of this is aimed at tackling some of the systemic poor practices in the sector. Uh, and as Richard says, it, you know, it's not accidental. Um, now, you asked about changes. Um, I think the other change is that there are changes to the rules about breach of regulations, the introduction of compliance and stop notices. So if the regulator turns up on site and sees something that they're not comfortable with, they can issue a compliance notice. If they think it's really out of order, they can issue a stop notice. Um, and non-compliance with those will be a criminal offence.
Um, as Richard mentioned, when a building is complete um, and has been signed off, you then have to apply for a building assessment certificate, which is the permit for the building to be occupied. No building assessment certificate, occupation is a criminal offence. Um, and you know, Richard made the comment earlier, there's not been a culture of enforcement in, in the sector. Um, people are going to find that they're occupying wormwood scrubs over certain things, which is a major change. Um, and, 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 and again, it's there to concentrate minds. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit more about enforcement in that, that context. So other changes that have been made. Um, there's no time limit on um, non um, enforcement for non-compliance with the building regulations. It used to be, I think, one year or two years. And there's no time limit now. So a prosecution can be brought at any point in the building's life cycle. The time limit for um, prosecution for failure to comply with the compliance notice has been extended to 10 years. Um, the uh, liability under the Defective Premises Act is now 15 years going forward. So that's gone from six years to 15 years. Uh, I think it's gone to 30, Richard. 30 retrospectively. Yes, you're right. So, um, which is a massive, yes. I mean, we could talk for about a week about the implications of that, but um, pr prospectively going forward, DPA 15 years. We have Section 38 that's due to be brought into force, Section 38 of the Building Act, which is civil liabilities. So um, any party, historically, it's only ever been the people involved in the building work who could really bring claims for damages and mostly under contractual mechanisms. Section 38 allows uh, anyone who suffers injury or loss arising from a non-compliance with the building regulations to take their own civil action to recover damages. Um, and that has a 15 years time limit. So uh, the environment that everyone's operating in, the, the exposure to challenge or prosecution uh, or litigation has changed absolutely massively. Um, on top of that, uh, they've introduced new offences. So the two I think that are most telling um, are building liability orders, which allow a court to track back from a company or that's involved in a building project. Even if it's gone out of business, they can track back from that company to any parent, sister or affiliated organisation and prosecute that organisation to pursue them for recourse. Um, and if an organisation is found uh, guilty, is successfully prosecuted, then all of the officers of that organisation also become uh, liable to possible prosecution as well. Um, and the grounds for prosecution are whether they've consented, consented, connived or acted negligently in contributing to um, a non-compliance or failure. Uh, so what the government has done here is it's cut off um, at the knees, the ability of industry to evade accountability. And this is the key, key thing with the Act. It's all about making sure that there are routes of recourse and that accountability can't be evaded. Well, that one's massive. Um, I mean, for a start, it means that the principal accountable person, note the name, principal accountable person, each word chosen very deliberately. The principal accountable person for an HRB has now got to be able to demonstrate to the regulator that they are managing that HRB safely. Not they were managing it safely six months ago when there was last a check or two and a half years ago, but today, can the principal accountable person satisfy the regulator that they're managing that building safely? Now, so for all the existing HRBs, um, they have until the 30th of September to register with the regulator. The website is now live, and it's not just putting the address in, they've got to put the key building information that's um, outlined in the regulations uh, as well, and that key building information has been carefully chosen by the regulator to enable them to prioritise the stock of existing higher risk buildings. Um, we think there are 12,500 to 13,000 of them, 
and starting in April next year, the regulator will be calling in the safety case reports for every one of those buildings. And if somebody is, ma is the principal accountable person, I believe they will have 28 days in which to respond once they get that call. So it's probably not a good idea to wait until you get the call before putting your safety case together because I'm not sure you'll be able to do it and get the report to the regulator in a month. So people have got to start preparing those safety cases, frankly, now. Um, and by start, I mean find out what you've got to do and where you're going to get the information and who you might need to involve in preparing it. Um, once those safety case reports are called in, the regulator will be looking at them carefully. The key question for them is, can this principal accountable person convince me that they are managing that building safely, that they understand the risks, that they're taking reasonable steps to mitigate the risks, and that if something happens in that building, there's a reasonable chance of getting everybody out safely um, without, without major incident. So you know, that's a huge change. We've never had anything like that. And again, in terms of sanctions or enforcement, there is um, a new offence, which is, I think, an uh, event giving rise to a building safety risk. So something doesn't even have to go wrong for a prosecution to happen. If the regulator determines that they think someone's not managing risk properly, they can prosecute against that. Um, there are a whole series of other procedural requirements, mandatory occurrence reporting, something very new for the construction industry. This does also apply during the construction phase. Um, but that requires any incident which could give rise to a serious non-compliance being reported to the regulator and um, details of the corrective actions being provided. But that, occur, that applies to the buildings in occupation. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, ongoing uh, uh, regulation regime for uh, HRBs um, also requires uh, the accountable person to have a residence engagement strategy in place. And that's not a nice to have thing, it's a structured engagement process to ensure that they are providing the right information to their residents, that they're getting feedback, that they're acting on the information they get, that there's an open communication process you know, that works both ways within the management of that yeah. building. And the providing information isn't a nice to have glossy pack that the, the principal accountable person decides what they feel like telling the residents or what they might like to hear. That will be described in further regulations. Um, and who's entitled to that information will, will be carefully um, prescribed as well. So um, that, that there's quite a lot there for principal accountable persons. And in extremists, the regulator, um, I mean, the, 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 the expectation is that for many buildings, their building assessment certificate will run for five years and the regulator will come back. But if you've got maybe a hundred higher risk buildings that are all of a particular structural type and they find something serious in one of them, the chances are they're going to go to the other 99, at least to say, we found this in one of these, you need to go and look to see whether you might have that sort of a problem in your building and come back and tell us what you find and what you've done about it. Um, they might want to go around and have a look at them themselves. Um, they might find that a, an organisation is responsible for a number of HRBs and they have a particular problem in one that leads them to think, actually, we're not sure this organisation is doing it properly. The chances are, I think, that they will then be asking for information about the other buildings that organisation manages, whether the five years is up or not. Um, and certainly, if there are incidents, they may well decide, well, actually, we're not convinced your safety case is up to date. Um, we're, we're going to ask you to submit a safety case report and reassess your building assessment certificate. And at the end of the day, if they don't issue a building assessment certificate, that building can't be occupied. So um, Flex 8670, I think, has been really helpful for industry in setting uh, some benchmarks for 
the different roles or disciplines to test themselves against uh, in terms of meeting uh, core building safety criteria. Um, competence and competence management are a new area for many people in the construction industry and many businesses. And that benchmarking framework gave something really tangible to measure themselves against, identify weaknesses and take action. And it's been very impressive um, the way that um, a wide range of organizations and, and sectors have actually utilized, utilized that benchmarking standard to help them to move forward. It's been very powerful. Now that came through a, a process of collaboration across a, an enormous range of different parts of the construction industry. Um, it's aimed um, to span across that vast range of disciplines and levels of competence or expertise. Uh, and I think that the ongoing collaboration that's come out of that is something that's very powerful and beneficial to the industry as a whole. We know that there are other standards coming forward, so um, we know within uh, BSI that there are proposals for standards for fire risk assessors, uh, for organisational management of competence, and for competence to um, specify and uh, market uh, construction products. So again, they're kind of linking into a lot of the other themes that we've mentioned in, in this discussion. Um, and those standardized frameworks and competence management systems, um, we hope, are going to give the industry confidence to embrace these changes um, and to implement them in a way that's pragmatic and sensible, because people shouldn't be afraid of this. Uh, there are huge gains to be made in terms of productivity and efficiency and in terms of the safe and sustainable outcomes that we want through um, uh, engaging with and kind of grasping these um, new ways of working. Those standardized frameworks are um, a good place to start where you need a high degree of confidence that they're going to meet the needs that you have as an industry actor. I think um, Flex A670 introduces some really uh, important concepts. So the first one that I think is fundamental is revalidation. We have an industry where people have qualified once and practiced for life without retesting, without reevaluation. That hasn't been healthy. That hasn't been good for the industry and it hasn't been good for the people working in the industry. We're playing catch up now. This is a common requirement across so many other sectors, certainly any of the high risk sectors, revalidation on a, on a periodic basis is normal. Uh, and we really do expect the industry as a whole to start to move towards that uh, um, process of retesting or reassessing people uh, far more frequently to maintain quality. So that's an enormous change. Um, Engineers also need to start to think beyond the boundaries of their own discipline. They need to be more familiar with where they interact with others and understand that they have that joint responsibility to manage those interfaces. But there's also an enormous component of culture change that's embedded in the FLEX. The first section of requirements all relate to behaviours, how people's attitude towards risk, towards safety, their understanding of their duty of care, uh, and this is a really um, foundational piece uh, that, or component that's been missing from the industry as a whole. Um, written into the Building Safety Act, the requirement for competence is skills, knowledge, experience and behaviours. Um, and that really underlines the importance that um, behavioural competence is going to have in the longer term. Yeah, um, it's becoming uh, very clear from the case law that's emerging, uh, primarily from contractual disputes relating to remediation, that the courts uh, have given priority to compliance with the functional requirements of the regulation mm -hmm. rather than accepting the minimum uh, compliance level set out in statutory guidance. Now, this is pretty fundamental, uh, and in real terms, it's actually a rebalancing of um, the understanding of how the law has always been meant to work. So the system has always been predicated on compliance with legal functional requirements and outcomes. But over many decades, 
um, compliance was understood to be um, taken from the statutory guidance that sat underneath that. That's now being rebalanced. And when I talk to our engineers um, at events and in, and in uh, webinars and so on, what I say is that you've got to look at the good practice, you've got to look at the statutory guidance, and you've got to look at how all that can inform compliance with that functional requirement. That probably leads towards uh, additional levels of mitigation and safety. It leads towards um, application of the precautionary principle where you've got uncertainty as to how well you're complying with those outcomes. And that's a huge change from an industry that has just tried to drive down to uh, the very minimum that is acceptable over time. So it's a big, big shift in mindset, but it's one that is absolutely necessary. Um, and I think more case law will come forward and it will become very apparent um, that the law is uh, focusing on those functional outcomes rather than the minimum standards. Yeah, and actually there's one other um, example uh, in the Phase 1 Grenfell Tower Inquiry report, Sir Martin Morbick addressed the question of whether the cladding and the external wall system complied with building regulations. And he was quite clear, he uses the phrase, I find in law that the external wall system did not comply. And he refers to the functional requirements. It's not about what the approved document said. The approved documents are guidance for use in common building types. Well, that tells you that there are some cases where you probably can't rely on the approved document, and it is guidance. The functional requirements in the building, they're in Schedule 1 of the building regs. That's what you've got to do. And it's also come up recently in relation to staircases. Um, there have been several reasonably high-profile instances in London of people proposing very tall towers with single staircases. My question's very simple. Can you demonstrate to the building safety regulator, can you convince the general public that if you build what you're proposing with a single staircase, that you meet requirement B1 to provide reasonable means of escape in the case of fire, or regulate, uh, requirement B5, which is to provide uh, effective means of firefighting. And if you can come forward with a proposal for umpteen stories and a single staircase and convince building control that you meet the functional requirements, then you'll be fine. Um, but you may find that the climate on that is changing and it is very much more focused on what's in the functional requirements and will your solution work for the type of building you're proposing, not a generic, oh, well, it was fine over there, so we can do it here, because here might be different. Well, it was one of Dame Judith's concerns when she published her report five years ago this month in the Independent Review of Building Regs and Fire Safety. And it was one of her four key reasons for systemic failure. Ignorance about the difference between re the regulations and the guidance. Um, and it's back to the illustration I've just given. The approved documents give people guidance. Generally, if you follow that guidance, you will satisfy the, 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 the functional requirements. But for, for HRBs in particular, the regulator is going to expect people to have made the step, if I follow this guidance, can I be sure I'm going to meet the functional requirements? And can I explain to the regulator and when we say the regulator, we're probably not talking about one individual here. Um, there are likely to be multidisciplinary teams working for the, the building safety regulator. So you might well have a structural engineer, a fire engineer, a building control specialist, at least. You might have one or two more. Um, and they will all be looking at it. Does the design that's been put forward for this building convince us that it meets the functional requirements. That's the key test. And it won't be you take something to the regulator, and like the old days, if you're not quite sure, 
your building control officer will help you out. No, they're the regulator. They're actually not allowed to offer advice um, because they're the regulator. Um, and, you know, th th they need to be very careful to avoid getting into a position of potential conflict of interest. So they have to stick to being regulators, and the people who are building the HRBs are meant to be competent. We've talked about that. So, you know, they need to be competent to explain how they've met the requirements in the regs, not merely, oh, we followed this bit of guidance, without thinking through, does following that bit of guidance on this project in these circumstances lead to compliance with the regs? Wise man, not you, Hal, although you're wise, <laughs> but a wise man once said to me, the difference, uh, a, a professional should know not only that what they do complies, but that it is right, and they should be able to explain why it is right. Yeah. Um, and that's the kind of correction we're making. We're going from, I did what it said there, to I am confident that this is going to deliver the right outcome because I understand why I am doing it and what it means. Um, is that a massive leap? I think it's a big change, but I'm absolutely confident we've got people in the industry who can do it. So we're going to have a new regulator and you know, they very much feel that they've been set up because of failings in the construction sector and it's their job to, to get the sector to address them. Um, and Richard's also mentioned the rather soft enforcement regime that we've seen. And it's not just in the building safety area. Um, in the Morel Day report that came out last month, there are some fairly firm statements in there about enforcement, or rather the lack of enforcement of product safety uh, and testing uh, requirements. Um, I don't think Paul Morel was able to uncover evidence of one successful prosecution uh, for a product safety failing in the construction sector, which is quite an indictment when you think of what we've heard in the last six years. Um, and I don't think that either the building safety regulator or the new office uh, or the new construction products regulator that's being set up within the Office of Product Safety and Standards, um, I don't think either of them will view that sort of track record as being acceptable even a year down the road. Um, I mean, I'm just mindful that all the high risk build, existing high-risk buildings have got to be registered by the end of September. Um, there might be a last round of, come on, guys, you've missed the deadline, you really should have done this by the end of September, if you don't do it now, messages. But I think if people haven't got HRBs registered pretty soon after the end of September, um, they will be invited to attend the magistrate's court um, for a discussion. And it's going to be a relatively easy one for the regulator. You know, there's a clear-cut requirement, register by the 30th of September. There's a clear-cut method of measurement. You know, it's seven stories or more, or more than 18 metres from the lowest ground at, by the building to the top of the top floor, the, the, the top of the floor surface of the top floor. That's a pretty straightforward measurement. So if you're in one of them and you haven't registered it, there's not a lot more evidence needed. Um, so, you know, that's a straightforward one for magistrates. And I, I imagine that the regulator's going to want to be in fairly early to demonstrate that they mean business and they will take action. So that's what it means for the, the sector. You know, we, we're going to have a regulator. They've got some new teeth, and frankly, they're expected to use them. I, I kind of look at this half glass full, which is unusual for me. So um, what that means in practice is we should see an industry that progressively gets more competent. That means in an engineer's working life that they should find their working life a bit easier progressively over time. They will have fewer problems to deal with. There'll be less collateral aggression and contractual dispute. So their working life should get better. And the reason that will happen is because the regulator is going to start taking the bad actors out of the industry. 
Uh, I genuinely believe that that's what the BSR will do. It will identify the repeat offenders and those who are not genuinely trying to be on the right side of the line, and it will prosecute and it will start to take out the really rotten tail that the industry is, has been competing with over a long time. So maybe it's medium term, but it could be quite dramatic, the change in uh, the capacity of industries to push to do better without fear of being undercut by the bad actors in the system. And if that's where we get to, then I think that would be a great thing. Well, actually a number of the professional bodies are already collaborating around the UK net zero carbon building standard. Um, you know, we've got this ambition to be net zero by 2050. We've got 27 million existing homes and best part of 2 million existing commercial buildings. Um, we've got 27 years to sort them out and to get them to be net zero. And it's not as simple as, oh, well, once we've got a decarbonised grid, then there won't be any emissions from the electricity. Um, there's the whole issue of embodied carbon whenever buildings are refurbished or built. Uh, and we've seen the fuss over the uh, Marks and Spencers proposals in, in Oxford Street. Um, so you know, there's, quite a, there's quite a lot of work to do around net zero carbon and sustainability. And if anybody says, well, yeah, but you know, sustainability is a nice to have. Um, it, it's, you know, it, it's all around, um, it, it's all got to be around safety and fire safety and, and that sort of thing. Um, I would, I'd say, take a look at what's happening in New Zealand right now, where they've had a string of really serious climate events this year. Um, the, the latest one just overnight and they are really beginning to see the hammering that their buildings are taking from more adverse weather conditions. Um, actually, there are some quite serious safety issues cropping up there. Um, you know, I don't think avoiding flooding in buildings is a nice to have, um, and it's probably got some safety implications. So we're going, you know, we've we've got to manage sustainability, and again, the professional bodies need to work together on that and not not in silos. I think we also have to recognise that whereas over time professional bodies have sort of ended up feeling that they're competing with each other, the context has changed. We have um, probably a long-term skill shortage, um, so the need to uh, compete for work share, if you like, is something that we shouldn't be, shouldn't be thinking about. It's not, it's not where professional bodies should be focusing their attention. Where we should be working is to um, progressively push uh, the standards of competence that we demand of our members higher across the piece and in lockstep. So professionals deliver um, huge benefits to society when they act competently. Uh, we need to push that competence further so that we get more benefits. That means looking at how we move together to introduce revalidation as a norm for competency and retesting and make that um, an accepted part and beneficial, uh, recognised beneficial part of professional uh, standards. We need to look at how we uh, drive the bar up in terms of investment in uh, training and professional development from employers. So how do we actually um, increase that investment? Our industry has a terrible record of um, low levels of investment in, in professional development and personal development. So how do we push that harder? Um, how do we um, mainstream a much more uh, rigorous approach to CPD through uh, genuinely beneficial lifelong learning? Um, and I think we need to do that across all of the bodies together. Uh, and we need to share our learning, um, especially at those boundary um, areas where we collaborate. We need to share that learning much more effectively. Yeah. And I'm going to be slightly controversial. You know, we need to work quite hard at attracting younger people into the industry. Yeah. Um, is it any surprise when people look at how the industry behaved pre-Grenfell that many young people say, I don't want to be involved in that? You know, at one level, can you blame them? We've actually got to start 
demonstrating that construction is a, a really good industry for young people to be in where they can make a difference and make the, wor the world we live in a better place by being in construction. And I'm afraid that's another reason why we need to drive some of the rogues and the bad actors, as, as Richard describes them, out of the industry because they, they don't do anybody any good from society down to, to people considering careers. Um, and you know, if, if the Building Safety Act and the associated reforms help us to clean up the industry, that has to be a good thing. Well, it's back to my earlier comment. Um, we've got 27 million existing homes that we want to make um, net zero carbon by 2050. So that's just a million a year. That's not a big deal, is it? Um, every new home that we build that needs a substantial retrofit between now and 2050 is an extra job to do. Um, and, you know, I, I do dislike it when people sort of do a job in such a way that actually they create another job for somebody else to do, one of my pet hates. And the blunt truth is that if we do that, that will require more skilled people, more resources and more money between now and 2050 to achieve something that a decent future home standard would allow us to start achieving now. So sorting out what we're building now has, has to be a priority um, because it then frees up the resource to go away and do sensible things with the existing stock. And we know that the embodied carbon in buildings is now becoming a much more significant component of the carbon um, emissions related to buildings than the operational carbon loading. So having to redo or replace or renew things that we're building today um, is a double whammy, isn't it? It has a double impact that's yeah. um, that, en entirely avoidable, if we're honest. It is entirely avoidable. And actually, I'm beginning to see evidence that it's feeding through into investment thinking. Um, I was involved in a discussion recently about uh, a development that's currently at the master planning stage. And assuming it gets approval, it probably won't go to site for five, seven, maybe 10 years. And one of the issues in that master planning exercise is the reuse of some existing buildings. And I asked the, 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 the lead developer, um, or I made the observation that I was sure they wanted to avoid getting themselves into a situation like the Marks and Spencers project being called in. And their response was, well, yeah, we do want to avoid that. But actually, the real driver is that the forward thinking investors don't want to put money into projects that might be seen to be high embodied carbon, because five, seven, 10 years down the line, that's bad for their environment, sustainability and governance, ESG um, position. And so they're already saying, we don't want to put money into high embodied carbon developments. And I think that's a really interesting move. And um, possibly not, I mean, it's not one that they're going to be shouting about at the moment. But again, going back to the net zero carbon building standard for a minute, that's not just a construction sector initiative. We've got the property sector on board and we've got the investment um, people on board because they're really keen to know how we can get a standard that gives them assurance that they're investing in the buildings they want to and not investing in the buildings that might become a liability to them. We can't do it individually, so we've got to do it as a team effort. I, I, it's really that simple, I think. Yeah. It, it, if you look at the longer term 
future for construction. And again, this is my view, but I think it's becoming clearer that this is the right, the, the only direction of travel. We're going to have to have a much more integrated supply chain, and that means design and project teams being much more integrated at an early stage in the project. This is where the Building Safety Act is driving us, certainly for high-risk buildings, but it's going to start to make sense elsewhere. We're looking at less hierarchical, more collaborative teams, um, and they're going to drive huge efficiencies for the industry. We've, we've got an industry that has um, uh, shaped itself around the wrong objectives, and it's become very wasteful and very inefficient as a result. Collaboration at early stages will drive efficiency through the supply chain in every way imaginable. imaginable. Um, and professional bodies have got to embody that level of collaboration and exemplify how to do it and then take that into the supply chain um, as, a, as a leadership piece, really. We, we're kind of, we're duty bound to kind of live by the values that we're promoting. So we must do that effectively um, amongst ourselves. We're doing things like this. Um, we're talking to our members constantly, I think. Yeah. Um, I don't know about Richard, but I, I write things regularly in Sibsey Journal. And I know because I, I see Building Engineer that, um, that Cabe is, is putting things in Building Engineer on a, a regular basis. Um, we're, um, we're running some training courses on it. And um, Sibsey and Cabe are collaborating at the Build to Perform event in December. Um, where we will be running various joint things, which Richard and I are currently um, working on putting together. Yeah, so I mean, one of the one of the areas where professional bodies need to do better is in collaboration. We, we need to be breaking down the, the barriers between siloed professional mindsets and behaviours. We need to be working better at managing risks at the interfaces of different professional groups. Uh, so the collaboration that we have with Sibsi is a is a really good first step. In, in delivering that. Um, we've been working with the Engineering Council um, and a number of other professional engineering institutions to develop a contextualized registration process, which is um, a process um, of assessment for engineers uh, to demonstrate their competence to work on high risk buildings. Uh, engineers can demonstrate their competence against uh, a general set of criteria or more specific criteria for fire engineers, structural engineers and services engineers. And that registration process um, will be overseen by the Engineering Council, so we'll have third party oversight and there'll be a publicly accessible register of engineers who've gone through and passed that process. Now that gives a pretty much what we think gold standard stamp of um, approval, certainly a much more specific level of confidence in the competence of those engineers. Um, which we think will help regulators, it'll help residents, it'll help clients to choose the right people to work on those projects once they've demonstrated they have the right skills uh, and experience to do so. Um, we're looking further at whether that registration process can be extended to assess people as principal designers uh, and we'll continue to develop um, processes with that third party oversight spanning the engineering professions um, so that we can build uh, confidence and um, uh, continue to kind of enhance the reputation of the engineering professions in, in these more kind of specific roles. And the other thing, both CABE and SIBSI as, uh, as engineering bodies, um, we require members to do continuing professional development. Um, so we're working quite hard at encouraging them to do that and providing materials. That doesn't mean you have to do your CPD with SIBSI or with CABE. Um, you know, other people provide good CPD opportunities as well. The key thing is that people are doing CPD on a regular basis, keeping up to speed, finding out what the Act and all the, the regulations require, uh, and, and helping to make sure they remain competent um, uh, 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 as the whole thing unfolds.
Well, the simple answer is yes. Um, it's really important that institutions that are trying to achieve similar things, and we've touched on a number of them in the last hour or so, um, we need to start doing that together more. Um, it's actually quite difficult to champion collaborative working if we don't work collaboratively as professional bodies. Um, and actually, we can achieve a lot more running that event together uh, at Excel than each of us doing our own thing. Uh, and there will be a really good technical programme. There will be a building safety strand, and I suspect Richard and I will both be um, taking part in that at various times, but we'll have a number of other high-profile and highly knowledgeable speakers, and um, we'll know more about what the new regime is looking like. Um, we'll know how long the queue outside the magistrates' court is, the non-registration of HRBs. Um, you know, we'll, this is an evolving thing, um, and we need to continue working together to make our members aware of what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. One of, the, one of the early pieces of learning that was done in relation to competence was that most disciplines in the industry don't really understand what the other disciplines do. And you can't break those barriers down through um, artificial means. Bringing these two communities together um, into a space where they can start to peer into areas that otherwise they wouldn't look at, where they can start to have those cross-pollinating discussions, where they can start to share learning and experience. Uh, you know, it's a natural way to actually start to make the, the collaboration we need happen. I mean, just, you know, a quick example. One of my pet beefs is that building control officers don't do anywhere near enough to make sure that buildings are commissioned. And it's a, they say, oh, but we don't understand that stuff. You don't need to understand it. You just need to ask, where are the commissioning certificates? Because most of the time... They won't be forthcoming if you ask that question. So you know it hasn't been done. You don't need to know any more than that. And there must be pet beefs that the building control people have got about building services. And you know, we've got a chance to start learning about these things and helping each other. You know, if, if the building control officer comes in and asks the contractor, where's the evidence that you've commissioned these systems? And the contractor starts shuffling their feet and looking a bit nervous. Well, they know they're onto something. And actually, your building control, building, sorry, your building services people, um, you know, would really like to see because more often than not, they're saying, look, you can't be serious. If you don't commission these systems, they won't work properly. And again, um, you know, with, with the greater focus on handover and whole life. That's going to be. We can't achieve net zero carbon if we're not commissioning stuff. Let's let's face it. But let's let's bring you know to tie this together to a degree. The building safety regulator has been very clear that it wants to see changes in the way that enforcement is is taken forward by building control, and what it's talked about is something called a track back approach. So historically, building control, if they identify non-compliance, will get that piece of non-compliance resolved and move on to the next issue. What the building safety regulator wants to see is building control saying, right, now we've got that to where we want it to be, why did it happen? Who didn't do what they were supposed to do? How did you decide that that person or that, that organisation were competent to do that piece of work? And then push back into the supply chain and challenge much harder as to the causes to kind of challenge and move that behaviour onwards. So these issues around commissioning and looking more deeply into why products are appropriate or inappropriate, we've got to share that knowledge more effectively. So this kind of collaboration is, is just going to be uh, entirely supportive of the development of the capacity to enforce better and to um, be more informed um, in both directions. <laughs>